This is the third in our series of um, virtual rural briefings. Our first session was in September, where our focus was on agritourism, and the theme of our event last month was land ownership. Both of these events are available to view on our website. Our programme is aimed at forward thinking owners and managers of estates, farms, forests and businesses in the rural community, with presentations on the pressing issues and the latest updates to keep you informed. Future topics will include agribusiness and succession and multi-generational farming, and you will receive further details and invitations for these sessions shortly. For today's session, we're focusing on the changes going on in the rural sector. We're delighted to be joined today by David Robertson. David is a, the Director of Investment and Business Development at Scottish Woodlands, and he will be sharing his insight and views on current opportunities with Woodland Creation. Kirsty McPherson, a partner in our Renewables and Real Estate team, will then provide an overview on what the opportunities and key changes are in the renewables space. Karen Smith, a partner in our land, agriculture, and rural business team will then tell us about environmental impacts on rural activity. After Karen's presentation, I will be asking the speakers questions that have been raised throughout today's session. Our first speaker, David Robertson, heads the investment di division of Scottish Woodlands. Day to day, he liaises with landowners, agents, and a variety of other partners to find place and secure a range of forestry and land subjects on behalf of private, corporate and institutional clients. With over 30 years of experience in the industry and 25 in management roles across Scotland, David applies his practical knowledge of the forest industry and the backing of a network of local forest managers to ensure investors get the best results to meet their overall objectives. And I'll now hand over to David for his talk. Graeme, thanks very much for the, the introduction. Um, I'm used slightly by that photograph you have of me there. I'm, I'm missing off quite a lot of hair now compared with that, uh, that one that you had up. Um, great, yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I'll start with just a, a brief introduction about Scottish Woodlands, um, a business that many of you may know. We're an independent forestry management company, all services management company. We provide a cradle to grave service. That's everything from finding and assisting with acquiring land um, through to the planting of that and the management through to felling and uh, future restocking. So cradle to grave in that process. We manage in excess of 250,000 hectares of land throughout the UK, worth around about uh, a billion pounds. We have 195 staff and 19 offices st strategically located throughout the main commercial afforestation areas in the UK um, and that includes um, the Welsh Marches and Northern Ireland as well. We're harvesting about 1.2 million tonnes of timber per year which is a rather scary 3,300 tonnes per day which equates back to about 11 hectares per day of, of timber that, uh, that we're processing which is around about the same area that we plant on an annual basis. We are responsible for about one third of all the new planting implementation in Scotland. And the investment team that I head up has been involved in about a million, uh, sorry, 100 million pounds worth of transactions in the last two years. Next slide, please. I think it's really important to talk about government support when we talk about forestry, um, and I'll come on to a bit more detail on that. Fergus Ewing um, and the SNP um, have been very supportive of forestry in the last four or five years, um, increasingly pushing targets, increasingly providing the funding that's required for forestry. And last year we had a combined 52 million pounds in direct grants in forestry. So a significant increase last year from what we've seen in previous years and we have a strong commitment going forward. Next slide, please. In respect to new planting, the forestry strategy produced 2019 um, February 2019, outlined a greater target for Scotland and forestation. The 10-year action, it outlines a 10-year action plan, but really is a 50-year vision. 
And the, the overall target there is to increase from 18% forestry cover in 2019 to 21% forestry cover by 2032. That's an increase from 1.45 million hectares to 1.68 million hectares, or an average of 13,200 hectares per annum. Next slide, please. You see here that the focus for delivering that ambition is to increase the woodland creation target from 10,000 hectares per year to 15,000 hectares a year by 2024-25. Just last month, that was actually increased to a target of 18,000 hectares per annum by 2025. So again, big steps forward. And, and tallied with that is, is also an aspiration to increase the amount of timber which is used within Scotland um, and pushing that from 2.2 million cubic metres to 3 million cubic metres by 2031-32. Next slide, please. New planting. New planting is extremely important to the forestry industry in Scotland and it's, it's the major area of, of, um, of, of a push for new investors. Next slide, please. You see here a graph indicating where we've where we've come from in 2010, which was around about 2,300 hectares in Scotland. Um, that was really at the end of our previous grant scheme, the Scottish Forestry Grant Scheme. We, we then moved into the Forestry Grant Scheme, the FGS that we're working with at the current time. And we've seen increasing targets, as I've mentioned before. So last year we achieved as an industry 11,000 hectares of planting in Scotland. Um, but our aspirational target, as you see in this graph, is to increase to 18,000 gradually over the period to 2025. This push is, is, is really driven by a couple of factors. One of the main factors is carbon. And when you consider that one tonne of carbon sequestered by a forestation and tree planting costs approximately seven pounds per tonne, whereas one tonne of carbon sequestered using mechanical carbon capture techniques costs over £260 a tonne. You can see why the Scottish Government and the UK Government are extremely keen to uh, develop planting targets with a view to sequestering carbon. Next slide, please. So land availability, how can we actually do this and how can we achieve it? Roughly 8 million hectares of land in Scotland and 5.6 hectares of 5.6 million hectares of that are in agriculture. That roughly breaks down into about 0.6 of a hectare in crops and four and a half, uh, four and a half million hectares in grazing. Um, and I think one of the other things we have to take into account is that around one fifth of the Scotland population lives on 95% of the land. So we have plenty of land available to us to, to start looking at. Next slide, please. And this graph demonstrates that the, the box in the centre um, are really the, the, the target areas of land that we would look at for forestry. So agricultural, agricultural grade 4.1 up to, up to grade 6.2. And if we look at that, we've got roughly 2.3 million hectares of land available to the sector uh, to consider for a forestation. And, and roughly 10% of that would, achieve, would help us to achieve the, the 2032 vision. But if we add in the red line at the bottom, which is the rough grazing um, 6.3 land, that almost doubles the availability of land available to us. And would mean that, in effect, to achieve the targets that the Scottish Government wishes us to uh, achieve, we would only really require about 5% of the available land area to do that. So whilst we have a, a, a you know, concern in agricultural sectors that, that forestry is, is, is expanding at a, a, a massive rate, pulling in agricultural land. I think to meet the targets, you know, trying to demonstrate here that, that the land take in relation to that would be, would be relatively low. Next slide, please. So if we look at farm viability, um, this is really you know, one of the main drivers for us and one of the main drivers for afforestation. These are average farm incomes as reported by the Scottish Government and it shows a, an average farm income of 2018-2019 was £34,000. This is across all agricultural activity. And with subsidy taken out of that equation, this reduces to a loss of £9,300 per agricultural unit. That's considerably worse when you look at the type of land that we want, um, which is really the LFA stock business sort of land. And 
that was uh, farm business income was approximately £60,000, uh, was supported by approximately £60,000, I should say, sorry, to reach a farm business income of, of uh, 24800 So if we take that £60,000 away, the average LFA stock business is effectively losing £45,000 a year. So why aren't we seeing more planting? Next slide, please. Culture is a massive aspect of this. Um, my small graphic in the middle um, with the, the evolution of man turning into, turning into farmers and then the, the concern of the plough then leading to trees is, is a massive impact for farmers. And, and, and what we have to understand when we are trying to buy land and we're trying to acquire land is that um, people have lost blood, sweat, tears, family members. You know, there's a long history of ag agriculture um, whereas there is not a long history of commercial forestation. So it's a real, a real battle for us that we have to, you know, we have to be, um, we have to remain aware of as we're trying to, to push forward. Next slide, please. But the future for forestation on agricultural land is extremely good. Um, this budget is a, a site in Ayrshire, um, 90 hectares in total, 70 hectares of, of commercial planting. And this site is showing a surplus of around about £65,000 a year. Go to the next slide, please. Bottom right hand corner of the budget, the one that everybody wants to see. Um, these surpluses um, are, are relatively common, certainly in, in central Scotland, where we have very attractive grants, um, Central Scotland Green Network, CSGN grant. But we, all have, we also have excellent target group grants all over Scotland. Um, these are secure treasury backed grant schemes and they're currently secure for grants approved. Sorry, that slide's incorrect. Currently are secure for grants approved to 2025. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of potential there for people to convert and to look at using parts of farms. We're not necessarily looking at whole farms, but what we can do with, with farmers is to, is to look at streamlining their business, taking away and planting some of the poorer land which allows them to concentrate their efforts on the, the better land, which is more effective and more efficient. Next slide, please. So just a, a quick look at drivers. Why are we doing all this and, and, and what's behind it? Next slide, please. I think we need to be looking at timber security now in the UK in the same way almost that we did when the Forestry Commission was established in 1919. Um, we are the, 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 the currently the world's second largest net importer of timber behind China with a, an £8.2 billion trade deficit on timber products. Global timber demand set to quadruple by 2050, according to the World Bank. In the same time scale, global population is set to exceed 10 billion. We have a, a desire globally, certainly within the UK, within Europe, but, but it's becoming a, a global issue to be carbon net zero within the foreseeable future. Um, and we also have aspects like the Chinese government's Belt and Road Initiative, um, even to create a, a trade route through, um, through Asia into Southern Europe, which could have real impacts on our industry going forward. And could, you could really start to, to impact the trade routes that we've typically seen from Northern, uh, Northern Europe into the UK. The graph on the right here kind of demonstrates um, some of the threats that we have. And the, the graph outlines timber use per thousand head of population in certain geographic areas. So in the UK, we use 147 cubic meters per thousand people per year. In the US, that's 275. They're much more reliant on, on timber for housing in the US. But in the emerging nations, it's 25 cubic meters per thousand head of population. So that just shows that we have a huge potential for demand for timber to increase when we look at the fact that the majority of the population expansion is going to be in these developing nations. Next slide, please. So timber, timber in the UK, um, very briefly, 1988 was a bad year for forestry. It was the, the year that I came into the industry um, coming out of school. Um, I would like to think that's not the reason, but um, it was the, re the year of the loss in budget, which basically took away scheduled tax from forestry. Um, Prior to that, we were planting roughly 30,000 hectares a year. We sort of tailed off after the loss in budget and, and, and there was a bit of a push. So 30,000 hectares a year uh, per year in the UK. 
That dropped down in 2010 with the removal of these um, tax advantages to just over 5,000 hectares. Thankfully, 2019, we're back up to 13,500 hectares or so. And worth noting that Scotland plays a major part in that, with 11,200 hectares of that 13,400. 13, Next slide, please. So if we forecast that forward, 40 or 50 years, the rotation of the commercial crop, we, we come into a period where we have a, a, an increase in the volume of timber in the late 2020s, early 2030s, and then we very quickly dip into a period of, of undersupply of timber to meet current solar capacity. So in our view, this is a major driver for timber value. Um, anything that's planted now comes into this period of undersupply. Typical supply and demand would suggest that that would lead to increased prices. Next slide, please. So taking on the back of this, housing starts, housing completions in the UK. Um, in 2019, um, we achieved 200,000 house completions. Um, the government's aspiration is to have 300,000 300, house completions per year by 2025. And I think we are all aware that given the current economic circumstances and, and, and COVID, that that's very unlikely to, to happen. However, that aspiration still sits. And even if we achieve 25% of that, we'll have a significant increased demand for timber products in the UK. Next slide, please. Just looking at timber frame use in the UK, I've mentioned the US being very, very um, uh, reliant on it earlier on. Um, in Scotland, 76% of houses are built in 2019 with timber frames. In England, that figure is only 22, so a significant difference in the, in the policies and the types of house building employed. So in the UK, 26%. Interestingly, going back three years, the, the figure in England was about 16%. So we are seeing a significant movement in England to off-site construction systems, timber frame kits, and that type of movement. Again, all significant drivers for timber use. Next slide, please. And that's no surprise. Um, timber is the only commercially available material that we have which can be used at scale, if which locks up carbon in the construction process. All of the other equivalent building materials are net carbon emitters in the, in the, process, of, um, in the process of establishment, in the process of, of construction. Sorry. Next slide, please. Mass timber, this is going to play a massive part going forward um, in, in both the UK and throughout the world. And this is effectively taking lower grade timber and uh, laminating that together into what we call mass timber. So it's producing very strong structural beams which can be used. In this case, this is a, a US slide where they now have approval to establish sites and build sites up to 18 stories. And we're seeing this all throughout the, all throughout the world now where uh, certification is being, is being put in place and uh, building control for you know, 18 plus stories in timber frames. This has a huge potential to lock up carbon in the construction process. So one of the most important things is if you grow trees to sequester carbon, how do you hold that for the longer term? And mass timber is very much the way to do that. Next slide, please. So carbon, um, huge driver for us. Um, just over a year ago, the UK became a, the first major economy in the world to pass laws to end its contribution to climate change by 2050. The Committee on Climate Change report, um, the UK's contribution to stopping global warming, was launched in May 2019 and outlines the route map to achieve net zero in England by 2050 and in Scotland by 2045. Forestry played a major part in that um, and identified an annual sequestration of some 22 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent at 2050 as a base expectation. Under the further ambition aims of the report, this could mean up to 30,000 hectares of planting across the UK um, per annum by 2025. And we've seen recently the, the UK government commit again to that 30,000 hectare per annum figure. And this is, a, this is obviously a real challenge, and not least with competition for agricultural land, which we touched on earlier on. Um, but on that matter, the report also outlines a significant trend in reduction of grassland areas with the predicted repurposing of over 3 million hectares across the UK due to changes in grazing intensity and a drive towards a healthier diet. 
Uh, so this, this may make some room for these changes to, to come. Next slide, please. Charismatic carbon, um, we can't get past this fact. Um, you know, what we're seeing um, is a, a huge movement from corporate entities into the environmental, social and corporate governance benefits, the SG benefits of carbon. And this slide here is um, the first to Google search, which was returned after searching for ESG forestry in the UK. And it happens to show a global fintech organisation who are investing in a carbon project in Scotland. Now, this comes with the promise of a tree per employee per year and um, you know, the, the, the carbon offset of, of, of employee travel and such like. So whilst you know, whether that contribution is actually large in the, the, you know, the scale of, of the UK or in the world contribution to carbon or whether it's small, the figures all sound extremely good to investors and other stakeholders. So we're seeing a huge amount of increase in, in this sector coming, uh, coming forward. Next slide, please. Yeah, and this is this is basically the outline, a simple graphic which demonstrates that every hectare of forestry, um, when you take into account all of the aspects, input and output, should sequester up to 7.3 tonnes of CO2 per hectare per year. So again, a major driver for us going forward. The forestry investment market. Next slide, please. And next slide again. So forestry investment market. Um, I normally demonstrate this slide and, and, and have values coming in at the bottom. Um, this, is, this has been overlaid um, for, for simplicity here, but the, the, the update on where we are at the current time, the average sales in the forestry investment freehold market are around about 12 and a half thousand hectares per annum and an average spend of around about 100 million pounds. So that's what we're seeing in the visible, the visible investment market at the current time. The recent forest market report that was produced uh, and just released yesterday outlined that for 2020, that figure has topped 200 million pounds um, and a sum of around about the average 12,500 um, 12, pounds per hectare. So, what we're seeing here is a, is a, is a very consistent upward value, um, upward increase in value in forestry assets. And if we look at that from the period 2010 to 2020, we're seeing an average annualised increase of 14.2%. If we take that from 2016 to 2020, the last five years, that's 21.8%. And if we look at last year, which has been a, an extraordinary year um, for, for many reasons, um, in the forest industry, a 39% in average capital increases um, over that period. Now, that's very geographically um, distinct in where that's happening, um, but nonetheless, across the, the, the sector, um, that's a, a significant increase. Next slide, please. So finally, just to have a quick look at the, the, the freehold market and, and, and where's that coming from? One of the major drivers for that increase in value has been the, the increase in value of underlying timber. And if we look here, the conifer standing sale index is the blue line and the, the price per hectare for forestation projects is the, um, is the, the brown line. The two are very much married together. Um, we have seen the, the conifer standing sale price index go, go away from the, the, the price per hectare um, of land. What we're seeing now is, is a sort of rebalance of that, where the, the, the price of the land is coming ahead of the index slightly. But we, we did have a, a, a period of decline in timber prices um, from 2019, March 2019, into early 2020. Yeah. Our expectations for that to, to, to be reaffirmed again and, and to come back. We have a very, very strong timber market at the current time um, across the UK. So next slide. And final conclusions. Um, a lot of facts um, and a lot of information there and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you may have but there is absolutely no doubt that the, the future global demand indicators and strong fiscal and capital incentives that we have um, mean that we are in an excellent position at the current time um, to plant trees across the UK and for forestry investment across the UK. So thank you very much and I'll hand back to Graham.
Th thank you, David. Uh, you've, you've managed to cover a lot of issues in a short time, uh, and there's plenty for our audience to be thinking about uh, there. I was particularly interested to hear your comments there on, on carbon sequestration. Um, it, it's something that you know we all hear a lot about at, at the moment, woodland carbon credits, and, and it'll be interesting to see uh, the impact that these credits and, and natural capital as, as a whole plays in the uh, in the market in the years to come. So um, our next speaker is Kirsty McPherson, who's a partner in the real estate and renewables team at Brodie's. Kirsty has a wide range of expertise in energy projects, both large and small, commercial property and strategic lands. So I will now just hand over to Kirsty. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, very nice to be here today. Um, I have to say, um, there's only positive discussion in my mind about renewable energy. Um, I'm excited by it. I have to say, uh, COVID has not affected us in any shape or form. I have never been so busy. So lockdown has gone by in a brief flash. Um, I am one of the lucky ones. I appreciate that. Um, so what I thought I would cover today is give a brief overview of where we're at on the different um, targets, etc. cover the different technologies and look at the opportunities. So if I could have the next slide, please. So UK has pledged to the Paris Treaty, um, which is on climate change. Of course, Trump was the, the one individual who said, no, America, will, although we've signed up, I'm going to come out of it. Biden has indicated that he will re-engage. I think that's a positive step. We've got COP26, which was due to take place as we speak in Glasgow. Now it's delayed until 2021. Positive, it's delayed, not cancelled. I think the, the next interesting point we've had in the UK is Boris Johnson's 10-point plan um, to get UK on track for net carbon emissions, zero carbon emissions by 2050. So the headlines to that were 12 billion of funds to support 250,000 jobs. Great, good positive brought forward the end of petrol and diesel cars to 2030. Previously, that was 2040. So the 10 points that he has um, challenged us with is a target of offshore wind, 40 gigawatts by 2030, hydrogen, five gigawatts by 2030, nuclear, 10,000 jobs, electric vehicle, backing manufacturing plants in West Midlands, Northeast and North Wales, public transport, cycling and walking, investing in zero emission public transport, I'm not quite sure how the walking um, part is going to go if you live um, rural, um, but I think it's all positive. Jet zero and greener maritime, so trying to decarbonise planes and boats, again, all positive. Homes and public buildings, greener, warmer and more energy efficient. Carbon capture, nature, we've heard um, just previously, he's looking to 30,000 hectares of trees to be planted in each year. And innovation and finance, the new green finance. We've got the next round of CFD in 2021. They're talking about late 2021 for the next round. Again, positive for all the renewable energy developers and anyone involved in this industry. So moving to the Scottish policy. So the key target for Scotland is to deliver by 2020, 2030, the equivalent of half of Scotland's heat and transport and electricity needs from renewable energy sources. Um, Scotland claims to have a 50 billion pound turnover in the energy sector. That was the figures from 2016. So that's probably increased since then. They also are looking to reduce emissions to net zero by 2045, five years before the wider UK. And their current interim targets are reduced by 56% by 2020. We're already in 2020, let's see what happens. 75% by 2030, 90% by 2040. As a general point, we need to remember Scotland is a net exporter of electricity, so they push more electricity down to England than they receive coming. UK is a net importer of electricity, so we do rely on interconnectors from continental Europe. That's Netherlands, France and Ireland. Reserve matters to the UK, electricity and gas, devolved matters, heat planning and consumer regulations. And if I could have the new slide, please. So what I've pulled together, and I, I love looking at these tables because I love looking at the development over the years. So we've got um, a period here from 2012 to 2018. So you can see this is the UK um, statistics. Even in the UK, we started at 11% in 2012 and we've moved to 33% by 2018. You can see coal is falling off a cliff 
we all know why, all of the, the, the sites have closed. Nuclear stays constant at present. If we could have the next slide, please. So the Scotland um, statistics are even more interesting. You know, we're up to, in 2018, we were up to 54.9% for renewables. Coal has, is now non-existence. And the reason for that clearly is Longanit has closed. Um, so it, it's gonna be fascinating watching that as time develops. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So what I thought I would do is cover the different technologies. And I thought solar was the most interesting because in a way, there's been less activity in Scotland than most of the rest of Europe. Now, there is an obvious reason for that. In Scotland, you know, we have less sun. We have long daylight hours during the summer. But I think this map is really interesting because it shows that Scotland just falls within the zone where it is viable to have solar projects. So I think although we've not seen a huge amount, we will see more. And I think we're already seeing more. I know there are less um, subsidies for solar, but technology and the pricing of technology has come down. So I think that is a positive and, you know, watch this space. We've still got potential for rooftop um, solar. There's nothing to stop everyone having solar in due course. Clearly it's down to cost and efficiencies. If I could have the next slide, please. So moving on from solar, hydro is interesting. Huge amount of um, hydro developments or the Runner River schemes, 500 kilowatts to two megawatts. That was all going on in the period when the feed-in tariff first came out until the feed-in tariff closed in 2018. Well, that, that was the time you had to pre-accredit for hydro. So we've all seen a lot of schemes. I, for instance, have been particularly busy on that. We've been doing lots of different projects and that's all positive. The, the sadness now is that the feed-in tariff, with it being closed, there isn't sufficient subsidy for the hydro developers to continue developing in this marketplace. Now that may change in time, but at the moment there's no indication that it will. And I think what you're seeing, you are seeing some of the hydro schemes being completed at the moment and now the tail end of the feed-in tariff. And so where does the market go for hydro? Well, it may have stopped on the development side, but it certainly hasn't stopped on the sale of the, the secondary market. So we've had quite a lot of activity in that. You know, I think everyone's heard of the Green Highland renewable assets. Well, they've been sold to Ancala. Ancala then sold to Symbec, which is part of the GFG Alliance group. And I know that the GFG Alliance have sold them. It doesn't seem to be public knowledge where those have gone, but there was lots of discussion a couple of years ago in the press. We've seen Scottish Power. They've sold Cruachan. Um, they've sold Lanark and Galloway schemes to Drax, a £700 million pound deal. Smaller scale, we've seen refinancing of different portfolios. So although the new developments, there's not a lot happening, there's certainly a lot happening in the secondary market. So moving to um, Tidal, Tidal in Scotland, um, we've got the Magen development in the Pentland Firth, 400 megawatts. Tidal has been, been more tricky with the um, CFD rounds and the CFD strike price coming down to around 39, 40 pounds. I think Tidal will be big, but I think it's a challenging time for the developers because the, the cost of developing isn't quite there. Um, but given we live on an island and given the tidal races and the tidal streams around the country and just the, the change in, you know, it's a guaranteed thing that twice a day that the, the height of the tide changes. So there has to be potential in it. Um, and I think the developers are working hard to find different routes to market. District heat, um, that's big. Um, we've been doing, not me personally, but another person in the firm has probably done the majority of the heat networks, which have all been in the public sector over the last two to three years. That's going to continue to grow as Scotland is trying to, to move to the renewable energy um, targets for meeting the heat and transport, as I talked about earlier. So onshore wind, again, big area. In Scotland, all the renewable energy that is created, about 70% of that is in onshore wind. That's a huge amount. We all thought that onshore wind, you know, two or three years ago, there was very little activity. It was all about building out the schemes and the secondary market. In the last two to three years, that has changed. Yes, the secondary market is still very big, but the positive is a lot of the developers, and we're talking a lot of the utility type developers, you've got Statcraft owned by the Norwegians, you've got RWE, 
you've got Scottish Power, you've got SSE, and then you've got some new entrants, you've got Fred Olson. Um, but they are all very active in the market. They're looking for new sites. It's exciting times. The sites are challenging because, of course, the easy sites have gone in the first phase um, of onshore wind. But, you know, the developers have become very skilled at, you know, they're skilled at the planning process. You know, there's there's lots of debate. Um, we've just had a planning inquiry um, for the Glensharrow scheme. That's the, the scheme in Newton Moore and Lagan. We don't know the outcome of it. But, you know, the developers are working closely with um, SNH, now Nature Scotland, I think. Um, and yes, there's challenges, but yes, there's potential, there's still plenty of potential out there. And I think that's great. You know, they're going to be part of the next CFD round. That wasn't expected two, three years ago. So that's due to open late 2021. You've got offshore wind. Now, the good thing on offshore wind is we've now got a devolved um, Crown Estate Scotland. So you've got Crown Estate England and Wales, and you've got Crown Estate Scotland. Boris has announced the targets of 40 gigawatts by 2030. Scotwind, the current round that's ongoing at the moment, with applications to close March 2021, have 10 gigawatts in that round. And the fourth round in England has seven, gig seven gigawatts. I read in the press that there's 50 gigawatts in, the, in process. So I think the government is probably feels that that target is achievable. Um, yes, there's challenges on offshore. You've got the supply chain. Um, but again, the technology is moving on. People, you know, they've done the first phase. So the really difficult challenges, or some of them have been overcome. I think floating offshore, and that's going to become big. Um, the Scandinavians, we've been speaking a lot to partners in Scandinavia, and they're very keen on floating wind because they've got such you know, deep water. It also is applicable in Scotland. I see that the CFD round is including floating offshore wind. So again, that's a positive because again, it's about bringing the costs of the technology down to allow the developments to occur and the developers making sufficient returns on them. Anaerobic digestion, it's always a tricky one, this. I mean, stepping back from it, and I'm no engineer um, or chemist, it, it seems an obvious one, particularly when it's waste, when you're converting waste to energy. You know, we've got to get rid of the waste. There are challenges in this sector, and everyone has seen in the press, there's various um, plants that have you know gone under I don't know all the reasons for that some of it is is down to the chemistry it depends where their supply is coming from so it's definitely an area people can develop but it's it's a challenging area um, co-location um, with battery storage again I think this is going to be uh, another developing industry it's at the very early stages I think everyone has seen in the press you know, different companies are announcing different things. If you watch the financial press, you're seeing different companies emerging. There's lots of technology and engineers. It must be a heyday for engineers because they're developing the batteries. They're trying to refine the technology. The costs need to come down, but the potential for battery has to be big. I mean, the two different um, ways I can see this operating is, you know, just having a big battery plant close to a grid connection point. So what will happen is the developer will buy electricity from the grid when the electricity is cheap. He will store the electricity and then they will sell it back when there's high demand and the prices have gone up. So that's a relatively easy one. You have to think that that's going to happen more in England than it may in Scotland. Um, that may prove to be wrong. Um, the other option for battery is co-location with uh, renewable energy projects. So. I understand at the moment the run of river hydro probably doesn't stack up because the technology isn't probably is maybe not cheap enough yet and it's maybe not efficient enough but you'd have thought in time this is a classic one with wind and solar you know we all read about curtail, curtailment prices being paid for to, to, to pay wind farms to stop generating because there's too much supply in the grid well in time what i can envisage and again i'm no engineer um, but I would have thought what we'll see is in those periods, instead of switching off the wind farms, they will store energy in the batteries and then that um, energy will be released back into the grid. Now, that may be a bit off yet, but it has to be coming. Um, transport, again, we've got big targets in Scotland and it's a question of 
you know, where does it go next? You know, will it be hydrogen, uh, electric buses? It's all going to happen in the next, or we're going to see massive developments in the next five to 10 years. We're all talking about electric charging points. You know, we're all going to be pushed towards the electric cars. That's great. I live in a tenement in Edinburgh. I can't charge my car anywhere because I haven't got anywhere off site. I can't believe I'll be allowed to run a, a cable out of my window down a tenement block and into the car. So, you know, there needs to be a fundamental change in cities. And I'm sure, you know, we know people are looking at that at the moment. The, you know, public bodies are considering how are they going to roll that out. And if we could move to the next slide, please. So what are the wider opportunities? Well, in my mind, where does it end? I just think it's it's such an exciting industry to be involved in. And I mean, I look at myself and I think, how privileged am I? I'm working in an industry that I find fascinating. It is always developing. So you're never doing the same thing twice. And it, constantly you're reading. It's difficult to keep up with all the different um, technologies and the developments and who are the movers and shakers are in the business. I mean, even through lockdown, I think that has helped this industry. I was in Delhi at the beginning of, uh, or just before lockdown, luckily I made it out. Um, and when I was in Delhi in March, the smog was unbelievable. Within a week of India's lockdown, I got photos from the people I'd been staying with and the smog had gone. The, the monkeys had come back to the center of Delhi. They haven't seen monkeys in years. You know, we've seen kangaroos jumping down the street in Melbourne. You know, and OK, it's all a bit amusing and everything else. But I think that the bottom line point is it demonstrates how quick the, the, the climate with the CO2 emissions reducing, how quickly it can adapt and, and change. And that has to feed into the whole debate on renewable energy and changing the way we operate our lives. Yes, I know it's going to take years. You know, we need industry we need production but i think what it does is it highlights how quick it can change and david attenborough is our biggest champion you know and it backs up everything he's been saying so getting back down to the to actual how does it help us as individuals well i think from a professional point of view i think surveyors um accountants lawyers yes there's plenty of work here there's a secondary market for surveyors you've got the valuations you're giving input on the rates um, advising landowners, cutting the deals, you're doing the heads of terms, then you get the lawyers involved, the accountants get involved in considering, uh, you know, the figures, preparing accounts, and we've got the secondary market of selling on the, the, the schemes, you've got the secondary market, so the larger schemes are definitely more with, you know, the accountants, or you've got Rothschilds have set up a, an arm, and they're doing a lot of the, the onward sales, you've got Royal Bank of Canada, um, and then from a landowner perspective, I mean, it's great, you know, if you've got big tracts of land, you know, there are going to be opportunities. A lot of people have had very good opportunities to date. I do genuinely believe there'll be a lot more coming. You, you can't predict all of them, but I think it's it's watch this space. Um, new technologies, you know, there's lots, there's lots of different ideas out there. People are trying to harness different things. We've got carbon capture coming in, is there going to be different manners for the, the carbon capture? Transport, as I've said, charging points coming down the streets, offshore and, and tidal, you know, yes, people say, well, there's not much for landowners on offshore wind or tidal. Well, there isn't when it's uh, dealing with the seabed, but actually all of that power comes back onto the land. And as soon as it hits the land, then you're dealing with landowners as potential cable routes. So, you know, I want to finish on a very positive note. I think we need to rejoice in how positive this industry is. We need to embrace it. I always think of this industry as Brexit proof and COVID proof, and that's proved to be true. Um, it, it's a positive. It's a good news story. And I'll leave you up with that positive note. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Kirsty. That was that was very interesting. Um, I'm going to move on very quickly to our last speaker today, Karen Smith. Uh, Karen is a partner in our land rural uh, business team. Karen's um, mainly based in Dingwall um, and has got quite a wide practice as, acting for investors and occupiers uh, and involved in a variety of uh, development projects. So I'm just going to hand over to Karen now. 
Thanks, Graham. Good morning, everyone. Um, as well as acting on the commercial side of matters, I do a lot I mean, our land and rural business team. And so um, in thinking about the theme for the webinar and uh, being the environment and climate change and its impact on our rural business clients, I, um, I was thinking about some of the conversations I've had with those clients during the pandemic and lockdown and in relation to the environment and the changes that are being made to their business because of, because of these things. And so uh, I also, I live on Sky, and so I want to tell you about um, the experiences living in a rural community during this time. And also about an interesting new client from the local area, um, a new client of Brodie's, whose business really seems to be capturing the zeitgeist of this time. So one fascinating aspect of the global lockdown was the environmental impact that we saw, um, measurable improvements in air quality, as Kirsty mentioned, and I think we all enjoyed seeing the pictures of the inadvertent rewilding of our towns and cities with the kangaroos, as Kirsty already mentioned. Um, I think most people accept that climate change represents the biggest global challenge of all time and every day we need we hear about new governmental and international environmental pledges and we've all become familiar with jargon such as net zero, carbon capture, natural cap uh, capital and the green revolution. Um, and so I'm lucky enough as I said to live on Sky and that means that I got to enjoy space and the outdoors even during lockdown and so I really understand the pandemic's impact on the demand for rural property and um, whilst once upon a time I've lived on Sky and worked remotely for the last 12 years and whilst once upon a time that was perceived as quite radical I think what we've been through just now and the home working revolution means that connectivity has become far more important than just a requirement for a short commute and that's what's resulting in the much talked about demand for rural housing that's going on at the moment. And it's also a demand that I've seen in my practice, um, the increased demand for Scottish rural estates with both UK overseas and overseas buyers being attracted to the privacy and seclusion that these estates can afford, as well as the stunning landscapes and less dense population. But as has been mentioned, I think already this morning, what is the dream for many actually causes issues for rural communities and it begins to price locals out of their local housing market. Um, Sky, as well as being a nice place to live, Sky is obviously also one of the UK's Scotland's hotspots for as a holiday destination and I saw firsthand the rush to the countryside at the end of lockdown. So whilst neither of these photos was taken on Sky, the very, they could have been, local sentiment was such that um, visitors were not particularly made to feel overly welcome. Um, obviously, there was a huge influx of people staycationing and I, Visit Scotland reports that 11% of UK residents who took a holiday in July and August chose to do so in Scotland and with two thirds of the Scottish population already choosing to holiday in Scotland, then suddenly places like Sky felt very busy again. And so I really recognise the issues that many of our clients were talking about uh, who diversified or had holiday accommodation as part of their business. And we were busy providing um, our clients with advice from teams throughout Brodie's with the various expertise that we had to tell them how they might operate their business during this time and the requirements on them for that. And we assisted them with developing protocols to ensure their safety and that of any employees and their local communities. And the easing of lockdown and the lifting of restrictions that meant many people had been cooped up for a long time brought many to the countryside that might not previously have ventured there. And we all saw pictures of the behaviour of the few that has impacted on the many. So perhaps not surprisingly, given the um, concerns around COVID and the impact of these types of behaviour, we've also been involved with our clients in providing advice as regards access. With the focus on global warming and cutting carbon emissions, our farming clients have felt scrutiny coming on to them. They've been labelled as Scotland's largest, second largest emitter, sorry, of greenhouse gases after transport. And so the farming sector is being told by the government that to achieve net zero, farming will require to reduce emissions. This is at the same time as the sector is also being challenged to adapt to our changing dietary preferences as we're all told to cut down on meat and dairy consumption 
and the repercussions of COVID with people increasingly wanting to know that their food is locally grown and to be able to source it locally. Clients are also having to deal with the Brexit process, failing to deliver clarity as to the way forward for farming. And there's a real need now for clarity on the regulatory framework and the support system from 2024 that's going to provide a pathway for the changes that our farming clients are being asked to make. So we've been hearing about trees already this morning, but one client was talking to me about trees and global warming in relation to fish. This client is busy planting trees for the benefit of the shading that it will provide to pools and stretches of a salmon river to try to prevent warming of the water because that would have an adverse impact on the eggs and young fish. The trees will also slow down the runoff into the river and that will reduce spate events, which will benefit all of us in that it will reduce flooding further downstream. Planting trees brings conflict with deer though, because one of the main obstacles to creation of woodland is deer. And I've had various conversations with landowners and factors on both sides of the rewilding debate. And I can see and understand and sympathize with both sides of the argument. And the, the, the thought is that the emerging carbon market is going to make rewilding economic in itself as ecosystem services such as habitat creation are given monetary values and so we may reach a stage where the planting of native trees will be more profitable than commercial timber i don't know david maybe you can comment on that um, in the question and answer or traditional farming or stocking or grouse management on moors um, with the future of carbon credits and talking about rewilding, uh, I just want to share this cartoon as it's one of my favorite, <laughs> I enjoy it. It also illustrates one of the arguments that the rewilders will use in that debate in that restoring our natural fauna and flora will actually encourage tourism into these areas. And that will generate jobs to replace the traditional employment on estates or in hill farming. But let me turn to the new client that I mentioned at the start. We've been talking about carbon capture today as regards planting trees. But another important area in relation to carbon capture is our seas. Marine Scotland published reports earlier this year that showed that Scotland's marine stores of carbon are about 18 times as large as the carbon stores in either our peatland or our forests. And I see claims that um, one square metre of kelp forest will capture five times more carbon than trees. And in addition to being useful in relation to carbon capture, seaweed is being used to produce new types of biodegradable plastics. So the new client we're working with at Brodie's is a small startup with big ideas. One of the issues with growing seaweed commercially has been the high cost of laboratory seeded kelp twine, which is then put out to sea to grow on. But this company has developed systems for wild seeding their ropes, and with that, they're starting their first kelp farms. And we've been working with them on their corporate governance, as well as the licensing and regulatory requirements, and also the leases with the Crown Estate. But it's the ethos of the company that is also tapping into more of the themes of the moment. They're working with local fish farming companies to repurpose parts of the fish farming infrastructure, which would either be sent to landfill or which would take a great deal of energy to recycle. And that goes to the idea of the circular economy. And one of their sites is actually located close to a salmon farm. And so there's to be scientific monitoring at that site to see whether the seaweed growth will benefit from the nutrients increased uh, let into the water from the salmon farming. And the hope is that we're going to see the development of a multi-trophic aquaculture model, uh, which is a phrase I have learned from these clients. And that's to do with the seaweed absorbing the nutrients in the water coming from the fish uh, which assists its growth while cleaning the water. And that will enhance the public perception of salmon farming, which is so important to Scotland economically. And if that's not enough, their hope is that in establishing a cost-effective way of growing seaweed, they can enable local communities along the coastline of Scotland to create their own seaweed farms and benefit from a blue revolution in terms of biodegradable plastics and climate change. So on what I hope is a positive and optimistic note, I will end there and thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, okay, so that, that's the last of our uh, talks this morning and we're almost out of time. So we, we'll move on to um, our Q&A session, um, but I, th I think I'm just gonna have to 
restrict it to to one question. Um, so, Dave, you're the you're the lucky one. It's a forestry related one. Um, to what extent do you expect the ending of CAP to influence the availability of land in Scotland for planting? And what more can be done to overcome the cultural barriers to deliver an on-farm integrated land use in which productive forestry fulfills its full potential? Yeah, that's, um, that's not exactly an easy one. Um, but <laughs> I, I would say that, you know, th there is definitely, you know, we see significant potential for, for increased availability of land. Um, with the ending of CAP, you know, I think what we're seeing at the moment is, is a lot of people sitting on land waiting to see what the outcomes are of a, of a, a deal or no deal Brexit. Um, and I do think that, you know, come the start of 2021, we will see significant additional interest. There's no doubt that farmers going forward um, are going to be required to provide ecosystem services, public benefit for um, for the money that they are presenting, and forestry can you know can can very much tie into that whilst providing a valuable asset for their farm unit. So you know I think the opportunity for the for the forestry industry is to is to educate farmers, look at the opportunities for streamlining agro agricultural businesses, taking away problem parts of farms, you know, almost every farmer will be able to identify parts of their, their holding, which always can, you know, consistently present them with, with issues, you know, whether that's, you know, continued financial input for very low output, or whether it's just simply operational, you know, problematically operational, you know, for stock rearing and, and stock control and stock management. So I think it's, it's, it's about, it's about working with farmers to understand what we could do to help them streamline their businesses. You know, what, what we don't want to do typically is buy the whole farm. You know, we, you know, as, as foresters, you know, we're interested in the, the poorer ground. And as I said in my presentation, it's, it's really all about allowing people to streamline their business model um, and make that as efficient as they possibly can. And, and in terms of the cultural barriers, is that something that you see becoming less of an issue? Are you, are you making some, some headway there? Yeah, I think we're making some headway. And I think the more people see neighbours doing forestry and being coming involved in forestry, it, it's, you know, it, it certainly helps. Um, nobody wants to be seen to be the, the last generation to give up. You know, people have put blood, blood sweat and tears into, into converting land from un, unusable uh, unusable hill land into into usable pasture and and you know that's been a, a generational sort of impact and you know people don't want to be seen to be giving up they don't want to be seen to be you know the last generation to to give up on that uh, that aspect so you know i think as more people do it it it, it will become fashionable and uh, not fashionable that that's the wrong word i think it's more acceptable um, and people are viewing forestry not as a um, an option of last resort, but as an option which can help them streamline their business and 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 look to the future, um, sure. as a, as part of a matrix, as part of a mix in the farm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, David. I'm afraid we're out of time, so only time for one question today. But we we will uh, respond directly to everyone else who has asked a question in the uh, Q and A function today. So I would just like to finish by saying thank you to all of our speakers today. Really appreciate them uh, giving up their, their time and sharing their expertise with us. And thanks to all of you for dialing in. We hope that you found the session useful uh, and you will shortly receive further information about uh, future events in the Bureau Briefings programme. Please do get in touch with any of today's speakers if you have any queries. Thanks again and have a good day. Goodbye.